Guten Morgen, Guten Nacht oder Guten Abend. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening. You can go to Louis in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to Louis in Austria or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become Austrian or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to Louis America and become an American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a new talk show program featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion. Brought to you by Kingsfield Law Office in collaboration with Think Tank Hawaii. We invite renowned immigrants to discuss their life stories, immigration adventures, and contribution to cultural diversity. Live from Vienna, Austria, today's guest is our good friend, our co-host, and my law partner, Professor Dr. Alexander H. E. Morava. Dr. Morava combines international and transnational legal scholarship and practice in a career that spans multiple continents. A dual citizen of the United States and Austria, he holds a faculty appointment at the American University of Washington College of Law in Washington, D.C., and recently taught at McKenzie Presbyterian University School of Law, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and the China University of Political Science and Law, CUPL, in Beijing. His work in practice, including representations of petitioners in various international tribunals and courts established by the United Nations and the Council of Europe. In this episode of A Nation of Immigrants, Professor Dr. Morava will share his life story, immigration adventures, and his re reflection on international law. Welcome back, Alexander. So happy to have you here. It's certainly my pleasure to be here. And hello, North Vienna. Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm just uh, uh, thrilled to interview uh, my favorite Austrian American from Vienna, Austria. You know, <laughs> I happen to have this uh, chance to spend a week in uh, Austria, and I was. Uh, hoping to sit outside to show the beautiful, uh, you know, street scenes from Vienna. But now we have uh, we are uh, 10 p.m. in Vienna, so I have to stay inside. But you know, you are our co-host, and you have come to the show, uh, the Middle Way and the Nation and Immigrants, many times recently. You uh, co-hosted the Law and the War special program on the Russian and Ukraine war with Jay, our uh, president of Think Tank. But we haven't talked about yourself. Now we, I want to uh, interview you and uh, hopefully you can share with our audience more about yourself and your immigration adventure. So please share us with a little bit about your family and how do they settled in Arizona in the United States? Sure, absolutely. I'll be happy to, to the extent that people are interested in it. I'm honored, actually, that there is yeah. an in, in my life story. Uh, from my side of the family, I'm really the only one who settled in Arizona, actually. My parents and, and most of my family are still back in the United States. We have a distant family in, in New York and, and, and other places in the U.S., but I'm kind of the only one who settled here. Uh, my wife side is, is different. My, my wife actually was originally from Vietnam. She's a mixed Chinese Vietnamese uh, individual who was a refugee, both refugee as a, as a baby actually. And, and her family by and large, all of them actually, it's a large family, ultimately settled in either Canada or the United States, about half and half. So when I met her, we were in different places. She, she was working in um, Philadelphia, actually. She's a a physical therapist by training, but she worked, was working in pediatrics. Uh, I was working in Germany at the time, so we were kind of long distance relationship in many ways. Uh, we then uh, decided to get married. One of the wisest choices I made in my life, I have to say, don't tell her, please. That's certainly true. Uh, we, we got married in Pennsylvania and then we moved to Virginia. Uh, at that time, neither one of us was uh, U.S. citizens, actually. We were uh, planning on ultimately doing that. Uh, her being in healthcare, 
certainly had an, an easy avenue compared to many other professions into a green card, uh, which were employed and ultimately applied for. And, and I have to say, in, in retrospect, I'm still flabbergasted. I think it took about three months for us to actually get the green card. I've never heard about that short period of time. Uh, and, and with that, of course, our sort of formal American adventure started. Uh, which ultimately led us to become U.S. citizens uh, quite a bit later, actually, in, in 2015. So we've only been U.S. citizens for about seven years now. Uh, this is, is sort of a, a little bit of, of the background. My, my, as you mentioned, my country of origin is Austria. I was born in Salzburg, and I uh, went to school there. I did my equivalent to a JD there actually. So spent uh, many years up to about 27 years old there and then came to study in the United States at uh, George Washington University. Uh, did my master's and my PhD there. And well, as they say, the rest is history. It, it's, a, it's a typical American dream, but it's an extraordinary American dream of Vietnamese, first generation Vietnamese American and married a first generation Austrian American and uh, well settled in, in, in uh, Arizona. Uh, you said you, uh, Nan, uh, your wife, uh, got her green card in three months. I believe she probably uh, went through EB1B, that's an uh, outstanding researcher and uh, a professor robbed, or EB1C, which is reserved for multinational uh, senior executive. Do you happen to know which route uh, she went to? I do believe it was second category. I think she was a highly uh, specialized worker in the field of healthcare. And, and I think one of the reasons why it, it went relatively easy was there was an absolute need uh, for especially uh, specialized uh, medical uh, healthcare providers in the field that she was working in. So that's, that's also a reason why we went uh, with her and not me, because quite frankly, lawyers are not as, as needed as, as healthcare professionals in this country. But let's be honest. <laughs> we need a lot of healthcare professionals, definitely still. And if you're a healthcare professional from anywhere of the world, you come to the United States and we need you, that's for sure. And it appears that she probably applied under EB2, that uh, maybe uh, under a W national interest waiver. But as a uh, a law professor and SJD, I do not know a lot of SJD because they're highly precious. It's very difficult. In, in legal community, we always say that that is a real doctor. Our JD <laughs> professor is not a real doctor. Only SJD, uh, doctor of jurisprudence, is a real doctor. And you are definitely qualified for uh, alien with extraordinary ability EB1A as well. So you don't no need to be too humble. And, uh, I appreciate and, it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so you went to George Washington University and uh, you got your master's and then uh, uh, your SJD. But uh, I believe you, you know, the, the reason we become a uh, good friend, best friend in the past uh, more than a decade because you were the uh, associate dean of University of Lutheran Law School in Switzerland. And I visited you, I can't remember how many times, probably five or six or seven times. And you, you, you spent uh, 11 years or 12 years in Switzerland, but actually you always keep your, uh, your very strong tie to uh, the United States, to Virginia. So should, I, should we consider your Austrian working in Switzerland or actually you or uh, American working in Switzerland? <laughs> well, you know, legally speaking, I was an Austrian working in Switzerland because it's so much easier. Switzerland is not part of the EU, but has, you know, it's part of the Schengen Agreement. So for all matters of work visa and, and legitimization, it's a lot easier if you're an EU citizen. Uh, so I was a, an American, Austrian, Swiss resident in many ways for about 10 years, to be honest. Uh, it, was a, it was a fabulous experience. I think Switzerland is an, is an interesting country. I always say there's more of a culture shock coming from Austria going to Switzerland because you expect it to be similar. And then it ends up being absolutely not similar. Uh, Switzerland is a much more closed society in many ways. I mean, historically, of course, because they wanted to distinguish themselves as being neutral and, and being uh, a hub for international law without being part of many things. Uh, Austria, on the other hand, is a traditional, more open country with uh, a lot of uh, different nationalities and ethnicity included in the population. So it was 
surprisingly have quite a, a culture shock working there. Uh, we, we made arrangements because as a dean, my responsibility was internationalization. So I had an agreement that I would spend half the year in the United States um, building partnerships, also teaching in the United States. So that ended up being a very uh, workable arrangement, to be honest. It was, it was a fabulous time. Yeah, so I I am a little bit you know surprised to hear that you are you have culture shock, and within Europe because in the Schengen area for uh, non Europeans like me, I feel like the Schengen area is a pretty one unified space, and uh, I can tell you I was a little bit surprised you know when I come to Austria this trip, and actually the past two trips this is my trip, third trip to Austria, mm -hmm. but two trips every time I need to apply for visa. Even uh, as a uh, having US passport normally does not require a visa to enter Schengen place. But uh, as long as the university compensates me in any way and I'm required to get a visa. And uh, the, even I, uh, my original plan is to uh, stay two weeks in Austria and uh, the Austrian consulate only gave me five days visa. That <laughs> is uh, what, uh, in, on the teaching schedule, I teach only five days. So the consulate said, okay, we only give you five days work visa and then the rest you are a tourist. So I think it's <laughs> really strict. It's that uh, the Austrians, you know, m uh, my wife said, yeah, it's that uh, Austria, everything is uh, just fantastic. And I love everything here. And it, uh, and they're just uh, just like Swiss and the German, but obviously we were wrong. And uh, there are a lot of cultural differences between Austrian, the uh, Swiss and the German people. If you were uh, uh, just, uh, you know, educate us for our ignorance of the outsiders. What, what are the major differences you see different from the Austrian uh, society and culture versus the German or versus Swiss? Uh, well, Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, I think are three countries divided by the same language. Uh, I, I could, I'm actually mentioning that yesterday to a colleague, a friend of mine, I could talk to a German person for half an hour and that person would not understand a single word I'm saying because our languages are, you know, if, if we go for it, we can, we can sound very different and we can really be separated in many ways. Switzerland, of course, has Swiss German, which is, is leans on German, but is, is really a foreign language in many respects. Uh, cultural differences, of course, Germany being a, a large economically dominant country is, is, uh, has a different standing in, in the world compared to Austria and Switzerland. Uh, the, the relationships are, of course, on the, on the formal political level, very cordial and close. There's still a little bit of an underlying historical tension every once in a while. So, you know, even within the Schengen area, when you cross into Ger Germany, you have the cultural feeling you go somewhere else. Uh, and I'm not saying that's even bad, actually. It's good that we keep our different cultural identities in many, in many respects. Europeanization is a good thing, but uh, we, we should still be distinct cultures and, and have a right to be distinct in many ways, even if you have the same language. So that's, yeah. that's kind of my very makeshift and not very sophisticated beginning of an explanation how there is differences. Uh, if you if you if you move to either one of those three countries, you probably will feel that they're very similar as an outsider. Once you get to learn uh, cultures a little bit better and, and interact with people, I think you'll probably notice the differences. And then again, within the countries, there are many sections too. And northern German and the Bavarian are by no means culturally the same people. Absolutely. Even though we all speak English in the United States, I don't. I think that we make a huge difference from Ohio and the Minnesotans and the North Dakotans or Arizonians. Very much. That's true. But for for an outsider, it's very hard to to uh, uh, distinguish the nuances. But yeah. you know, you I think you are lucky. Uh, 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 I admire become a, a dual citizen of the, the United States, Austria. There are some countries do not accept dual citizenship. And afford, but fortunately, uh, both the United States and Austria do. So you have two passports. You're two citizen of the United States and uh, Austria. Uh, I, I'm just, on the contrary, I'm just a Chinese Minnesota. And uh, two weeks ago, I visited Supreme Court of Minnesota and told Chief Justice Gildi of Minnesota said, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm 70% uh, Minnesotan and 30% of Chinese American. <laughs> and she was very pleased. Uh, pleased to hear that because she is originally from Minnesota and a big fan of Minnesota uh, uh, history and the culture. So I was wondering whether you could quantify 
the Austrian, American, and Arizonian aspect in yourself? Yeah, well, let me first say you are very distinguished uh, Chinese American Minnesotan, so you're not just just one of those. Uh, I think you stand out in many respects uh, through your career and also your your personality in a way which is you know uh, epitomizes uh, the good version of an immigrant, right? <laughs> uh, critical but patriotic, right? In many, in many ways. Uh, by the way, the dual citizenship is not an easy feat, actually. In, in Austria, you would lose it automatically unless you prove to the government that they want you to keep the citizenship. And that's really an uphill climb. Uh, it took a, a lengthy petition, was costly as well, to show to them that I had accumulated sufficient merits that they would actually want me to. And, and ultimately they, they sided uh, with my arguments that I'm important enough. It was the first time in my life where I had to kind of argue that I'm an unimportant individual <laughs> that somebody wants to be a citizen of, which was a little uh, unusual. Well, I, to your question, actually, uh, Arizona is uh, one of the states that is uh, vigorously independent, you know, the old gunslinger Wild West mentality still survives in Arizona. That's why um, the majority of the voters actually are registered independents. Uh, and, and I think that makes it easy for me to in include myself in this community, which is very diverse, actually. Uh, it's increasingly becoming a, a melting pot of individuals coming here, especially with nanotechnology uh, and many other industries moving into the area. So I think Phoenix is becoming a very cosmopolitan area now. It's in just 100 years. I mean, 100 years ago, this was a, uh, basically a, a, a village of 5,000 people. Uh, when I'm in the U.S., I feel more Austrian. When I'm in Austria, I feel more American. I think that's kind of natural. You become more patriotic when you're not there. <laughs> uh, and and I, I feel all the time that I have to explain myself. I mean, during the past five years, especially the four initial of the five, uh, we Americans always ran into a lot of questions. Right when we traveled internationally, and and when it came to the foreign policy of the previous administration and and the withdrawal from many things that especially are dear to Europeans like NATO and European Union economic integration, uh, ultimately always got the questions: What's going on with you Americans? And then I, I felt I had an obligation to explain us a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. with the understanding also why the questions were being asked. That there were, uh, I would even say, desperate questions. People were saying, what's going on? Why is this like this? Can we still count on you? Mm -hmm. uh, and I tried to explain that, yes, this is a, a phase, quoting <laughs> Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a period of time, and we'll get over that. Uh, and then there will be a, a coming back to normal circumstances. When I'm in, in the United States, of course, I'm, I try to bring in uh, European culture and, and, and politics as well, and make things, uh, explain things to Americans as well. It's a little educational exercise, too. That's a great point. And what you, you just said, it just reminded me that I always uh, 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 tell my friends that I'm uh, the Chinese because they think I'm too American to be a Chinese, <laughs> and American friends think I'm too Chinese to be American. But the, 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 this is real. This is uh, real for people like you and, uh, and me uh, live and function in two different cultures. Yep. But I recently, I spent you know, two months in China uh, last year, as you, you know, and I keep reminding myself the paragraph I read from the uh, book, My Life in China and America, uh, authored by Yun Wen, the autobiography of Yun Wen, the first Chinese student to graduate from American University, Yale, University. Uh -huh. And in this book, he wrote, would it not be strange if an Occidental education, continuously exemplified by an Occidental civilization, had not read upon, wrote upon an Oriental such a metamorphosis in his inward nature as to make him feel and act as though he was being coming from a different world? When he confronted one so diametrically different, this was precisely my case. And do you feel some reverse culture shock when you travel back to Austria? And when was your last time in Austria? I understand you will come back to Austria next month, but when was your last trip in Austria? And do you feel something different than the previous trip? 
Well, you know, that, that immediately brings up the term of the century, COVID-19. Of course, uh, when we traveled last, we, we couldn't travel in 2020. So we had to postpone our customary summer in Austria, which we always do. Uh, when school lets out, we, we pack up and go to the extent we can. Uh, we, we went back last year. And uh, the first thing that struck me was a relatively widespread willingness to deal and accept, deal with and accept the restrictions that COVID imposes on our lives. So there was no questioning when you went into a supermarket, you would just put your mask on. There, there, nobody said, I'm not gonna do that. People would just do that. Uh, when you went to a restaurant, you would have to show you proof of vaccination or recovery or uh, couldn't go in, right? And, and you were prepared to do that. Once I forgot my phone, I said, um, it's my fault. I didn't bring the phone. I can't go with you right now. I have to go and get my phone. So there is much more acceptance of, of measures like this, which is certainly a cultural phenomenon. You know, the Europeans by and large prefer regulation over litigation. That would be the legal explanation. Uh, and they're a little bit less individualistic when it comes to measures that benefit the, the, the community as a whole. So I noticed that quite differently. Doesn't mean that there isn't conflict. When it comes to COVID, there's also a strong minority group that is very, very much an anti-vaxxer, anti-masker mentality, but it's less prevalent, it's less, less visible in many ways. And then I really noticed how, how culturally hadn't changed. People were trying within the constraints they were finding to live their culture, live their literature, live their experience in a daily life, you know, enjoy the outdoors to the, to the extent possible. Uh, so I think that the, the non-change really was, was striking to me that people really were working towards uh, recuperating from that disruption that COVID certainly was posing on us. Now you have seen it, um, most of the measures have been lifted basically, you don't have to wear masks in public anymore except for certain locations like supermarkets and, and drugstores. Uh, and I'm sure when we land in Vienna in about two and a half weeks, we will notice that things have gone back to more normal than we had experienced a year ago. I'm, I'm looking forward to that uh, with also a little bit anxiety because we're not, we're not in a past COVID period of time. <laughs> it's still there. Uh, ask the people in Shanghai and Beijing and they'll confirm. <laughs> Well, and, um, Korea, of course, I mean, that's the last place where this uh, crisis has uh, erupted. Absolutely. But we have an effective vaccine and we have, you know, a therapeutic measure. I think that is the only scientific way to deal with it, not from administrative, pretty harsh, you know, draconian uh, administrative measures, uh, uh, treating every uh, positive case like a criminal. That is not the, the a way to do that. But that brings back to you know uh, uh, my next question. You know we we landed in Vienna uh, last night and we transferred in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, everything we saw that my wife commented that the civilization has fully recovered. That's her comment. I I totally agree. It feels like the civilization has recovered and back to what we hoped it could to be. But I I feel like I. I, I'm holding this precious moment. Now, I don't know this civilization can last how long. And you are special, your specialty is international law. And just, just look at what's happening in the world, in, in Europe, in Ukraine, in Asia. We know that the world can change overnight. And what, what's the point of an international order if the, some thugs and bullies can simply just violate it? And not only treating their uh, other country uh, badly, also treating their own citizen badly. So, do you have a, a keep your positive attitude towards the common destiny of human being, or you are also less confident that we we all have a collective future in Europe and in Asia and in, in the United States? Um, minus the gift of prophecy, which I, which I do not possess, I, I have to confess I'm really torn between those exact positions that you, you bring up, between desperation on the one hand, uh, if you look at the war in Ukraine right now and, and many other situations that you could list, but it would take me 10 minutes to list. Uh, so let's just use the war in Ukraine, a collapse of the international legal order is not an impossible outcome of this entire uh, 
process. And it, we have to bear that in mind. We have to always think about the worst case possible scenario. Uh, I, on the other hand, am an optimist. I think out of this, we already have seen international organization has become much more relevant. All of a sudden, we rush to the European Union, where we previously were kind of rushing away from. Look at Brexit, look at the criticism and the conflict with Poland, uh, conflict with Hungary, and Urban has just been re-elected, still part of the European Union. We All of a sudden, we realize that NATO is something that's not just, you know, uh, dusting off all tanks and actually has to do some real things to do. And, and all of a sudden, people come and want to join it because it gives them a feeling that security is a collective enterprise, not, not just a single nation activity. So we probably have to reinvent the international order. Uh, and quite frankly, we haven't reinvented it since 1945. Maybe it's time, yeah. right? We, we still think we can deal with a, a reality that basically had a Hitler and the Moscow Mussolini. Now, to the extent that Putin resembles those two characters, and, and he does to a certain extent, that's true. But there's also conflict, and North Korea being probably one of the most prominent examples, where totally new types of threats to international peace and security are a daily occurrence. So we probably have to reinvent the machinery that works on, on, on those. And, and international law has to contribute to that, I think. Absolutely. Fantastic point. Is it rather like the autocrats to reinvent and upset the current peace order? And we should just uh, reinvent it. And uh, yeah. we are running out of time. It's always fun to talk to you, but we always end our uh, show to ask our distinguished guests two questions. Question one, if you were giving some advice to yourself in your 20s, if time travel permitted, what would you say to yourself in your early 20s? Second question, is there a particular book and the movie you are enjoying right now you want to share with our audience? Yeah, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether I'm much smarter now than I was in my early 20s. Uh, that, that means I was a genius in my early 20s or I'm not particularly smart right now. So I'm not sure what I would have to contribute that much to my own future if I had the chance to go back in the past. Uh, uh, probably I would suggest to uh, you know focus a career a little bit more on the the safety and security of the personal future. I'm talking about uh, issues like retirement and so on, where a, a global career sometimes uh, causes more disruption than there should be. So uh, streamlining things a little bit would be probably a, a call that I would make to myself, but that's a very personal remark here. Uh, your second one, I can show you what I read last actually, and it has to do with the uh, topic that we talked about. <laughs> The great successor. Yeah, it's, uh, a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a novel. A or, uh, is it novel or a fiction or nonfiction? Oh no, no, it's a it's a nonfiction book uh, oh. by Anna Fifield. Actually, she's a former um, journalist based in Beijing. Actually, uh, okay. traveled to North Korea many, many times, and it's the first real biography, really, of, of, of him, the younger. Uh, and it, it shows a lot of interesting, it raises a, a lot of interesting questions about the personality and, and the identity of a single individual who runs a country of 25 million people with an iron fist. Uh, and and I've, one of the questions that I've never been able to answer for myself is why are there Putins and why are there Kim Il Yungs uh, in the world? <laughs> how, how can one rule 25 million and why do they follow? But I think that's a question that needs an entirely different show that would have to spend days, if not weeks, to discuss it properly. I agree. I, I definitely will check it out. It's, uh, it's a monarchy, it's yeah. a pre modern monarchy. And in the 21st century, it's just a absolutely you know stunning to see that. But they are you know they, they, they in the foreseeable future, I don't think that uh, this will change uh, in this, that part of the world. But anyway, we run out of time. Thank you so much to be on the show, uh, Alexander. Uh, today's a nation of immigration, immigration. Our distinguished guest is our co-host, law partner, and good friend. Alexander H. E. Morava, uh, SJD, a real doctor. And you are too humble, Alexander, but thank you so much for sharing your story. And this is a nation of immigrants live from Vienna, Austria.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It's always a privilege to be on the show and uh, chatting with you is always a delight. Look forward to our next show. Take care. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.